Now, I should be live about now. Uh, hello, guys. Please, uh, let me know in the chat if you can hear me. Uh, like, press 1 to say, yeah, you can hear me perfectly fine. Um, if not, you know, don't. <laughs> it's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. How's everyone doing? I'm just gonna quickly show up what we're gonna talk about today. So. So today we're gonna be... Okay, so I'll give some context for um, everyone here first. So, I today was talking with some pagans. Uh, I decided that I'd do a lot more digging into pagans to try and figure out their um, extrinsic motivations for their beliefs and things like this, you know, like modern pagans. And so I ended up talking to a bunch of them. And one of the guys that was involved recommended this particular YouTube channel called um, Ocean Keltoy, which is, you know, one of the which is a reasonably large um, pagan channel here. And this guy is um, an ex-Christian, and he's provided a couple of arguments against Christianity. And I thought it might be interesting to go through this, because I think... Uh, I've actually seen versions of this argument in um, in a book by Joseph Baptist Cardinal Franzelin called On Divine Tradition. It, it strikes me as very similar to Roman Catholic, that is, Christian talking points in places which is kind of strange and I thought it would be a good idea to go through this video and show precisely why this guy why this guy doesn't actually destroy Christianity in the way he thinks he does he only really destroys a version well really Protestant him when he's talking here so um, and also to point out some some issues that I can kind of see from certain views of, um, of paganism at least a view that I'm not sure I'd say he held, but it certainly made me think when he mentioned something about his view, about a view of the gods as um, you know independent floating kind of superheroes, as well as toward against a kind of Pelagianism, which he says he says he's really influenced by um, Pelagius. Um, for those who don't know, he's a fifth century heretic who believed that man was uh, perfectible without divine grace. So I thought that I'd talk a little bit about that there and you know, the essence of Christian metaphysics and how this would entail a rejection not only of um, gods as purely superheroes, or rather, gods that are worthy... Okay, the Most High can't be just a superhero, maybe that's a better way of putting it. And how this would not allow any kind of Pelagianism. Also, um, for those who are watching, I'm hoping... Because I was told by Pagan that he'd probably tune in. I've written in the description... A document which is basically my notes for this stream because I went through and decided I would uh, you know go over this again articulate uh, you know the views that um, I thought were, were, were really an issue and to be honest this entire argument I think we can hear you lots of static and fan noise okay um, <laughs> let me move my, my mic a little bit in that case hopefully this will make it a bit better you probably heard a big whack as that hit my uh, my desk Let's see if I can't clear my desk up a little bit. Right. Is that better, by the way? P also, please share this on uh, Twitter and likewise. Um, it would be nice to you know get more people on here, particularly pagans. I'm kind of curious. Particularly if we can get this Ocean's, Ocean Keltoy guy to watch, that would be really cool. Uh, at the very least, get this document that I've written into his hands. That would be It would be interesting to hear his response. 80% fixed. Okay, that's that's good enough. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna play a little bit of the video, and I'm gonna ask you guys if you can hear it. So if you can hear it, uh, press one. I'm gonna pop the chat out so I can see it a bit better, so I can kind of tab between it. All right. So um, type two if you can hear it. Do y'all remember Tommy McMurtry? Here's a question: If communicated to him a sentence that contained the word is would he be able to understand it the son of man which is in heaven it's present tense right bible talks about people handling the word of god deceitfully that's thinking tommy mcmurtry and stephen a i think that you've uh you've got okay you can hear it okay good so he's gonna take he's gonna begin with this as um you know a kind of an argument okay everyone can hear it that's good he takes a little bit of time to get into the argument, but I'll let him talk for himself, because, you know, I have the syllogism right here in front of me. 
But I think it's better summed up in his words, because after all, it's his argument. Anderson and all these liars! Apparently not. Okay, I'm going to increase the speed. Now, I mentioned some time ago that when I first converted to paganism, one of the things that happened was that word kind of just got out. <laughs> I was attending a college that was mostly Christians, and a lot of them really wanted to save me from my beliefs because, you know, hell and stuff. Uh, but they made it their personal mission to bother me between classes or lunch or even at the doorway to my own dorm room because they wanted to make sure that I had considered Christianity from their perspective. Now, I had considered Christianity very seriously for some time, and I left for a myriad of reasons that I'll get into in another video. But suffice to I mean, like, looking at this, I think... I, I think that... There's a difference... Okay, let me, let me think about how I can be nice about this. There are more forms than Christianity than just contemporary American Protestantism. It's an extremely deep topic. And it requires a lot of study, and I think that in light of that, uh, you know, giving some study to Roman Catholicism at the very least uh, would have probably answered this argument fairly quickly. But, um, you know, I don't think that's something that really occurs to a lot of Americans being a highly Protestant country. When they think Christianity, they think, you know, evangelical Protestantism, maybe. I don't so know, I'm not American. that they generally asked, or the objections that they would come to me with, were things that I had at the time thought through pretty thoroughly. Because I didn't take leaving Christianity lightly. I didn't want to do it, but it happened. And I'm But I mean, you chose to. Like, it's one thing to have your intellect engaged in a certain way, but don't say you didn't choose. Like, you could have held on despite the objections that you had. I was alluding being honest with myself, so I took the journey. No, in, I fact, I th in fact, I think if you dug a bit more, like I said, I don't think you'd be in the situation. I wasn't pagan immediately after leaving Christianity. It was a process, but by the time word got out, I was a form of Celtic spirituality that had some elements of polytheism and panentheism. It was a mishmash of druidic spirituality that was heavily inspired by Pelagius. But whatever the case, I started bumping into people that had more interesting arguments for Christianity, or at least the Triomni God, and I wanted to know what the objections to those arguments were. Examining these arguments honestly is actually what eventually drove me toward polytheism. The arguments worked better, the position was more defensible, and I thought, I should explore this more and see what's there. So I did. And I found a ton of interesting things, and I also found that it was more resilient against arguments typically thrown at Christians, which fascinated me. So, this took me into another stage of looking at arguments, for a couple of reasons. Uh, I started collecting arguments against the Christian God that I could just kind of keep in my pocket. Reasons being is that it was interesting to see how they would work against my own position. And another was that I think it could be a good idea to keep these arguments around if a Christian gets a little pushy with the, uh, tra <laughs> tradition of witnessing. <laughs> it can change the dynamic of the conversation pretty quickly, and it can get people to think twice before bothering you again. Or, you know, it can just make people mad, which good times but uh, there's a couple or you know actually I won't <laughs> a couple of them that I think are just knock down arguments they're just damn near impossible to address and one of them is a very interesting one I don't I don't think this is one of them I, I in fact I don't think you have any arguments like that <laughs> if I'm entirely honest with you mate because if you were to offer philosophic like philosophical arguments right we already have responses we've been responding to paganism for 2000 years a lot of them are in our own scriptures in fact in the old testament one called the interpretation argument. Like, even from a position of natural um, natural reason, I, I think that it's impossible to avoid classical theism. And then from there, you you know you talk about the historical arguments for the Old and New Testament, and a lot of these are fairly straightforward. This argument is lovingly called Tia by those that advocate for it, and it's basically summarized as Christians disagree with each other, therefore God doesn't exist. Uh, it's more complicated than that, obviously. And what God that it's talking about is fairly targeted. So let's get into it. I mean, obviously that that summary there doesn't really follow, but he'd actually, if you take his premises, I, in fact, I don't think even the premises that he has really lead to the conclusion that he wants, but we'll get into that in a moment. This argument is predicated on a deity which is omnipotent and omniscient, and if this deity does not have these properties, then the argument fails. It's intended for any deity that is any reasonable definition of omnipotent, uh, the most scaled back of these being maximally powerful or able to bring about any logical state of affairs, but it'll also work for a more laid back definition of like able to do anything. We can also use it also, actually, you know what, I'll, I'll spoil my argument later, because, uh, because, like, there's, there's, there's a little bit of, uh, a nuance here that he misses, and it leads to some significant problems with the argument. Any reasonable definition of omniscient, which could range from knowing everything to having knowledge of all true propositions, or even the most specified, having knowledge of all true propositions and no false beliefs. You know, these are all reasonable definitions of omniscient that are debated among Christians and classical monotheists. But any of them work for the purposes of this argument. I see you advocates of divine simplicity when I say properties. Descriptors might work better, but what matters is if the deity is omnipotent. I mean, we'd still call them properties. We would just say that it's the same indivisible being. And omniscient. So, the important part is, is that this isn't predicated on scooping out some specific idea of deity. This is a concept that applies to most Christians and most monotheists generally. 
but we'll stick with Christianity for now. But it's true that there are Christians who do not hold these properties to God or descriptors or whatever, and but they hold a more like scaled back image of the Christian God. And this may not apply to them, but overall, this is a pretty easy thing to get Christians to agree to. And once they do, they're uh, they're done for. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, fam. So from there, we get into a couple of premises that Christians would generally agree with. Premise one. I, I don't mean to be me. I, I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have laughed. That was me. Uh, by the way, guys, yeah, don't be mean to these guys, or I'll just uh, delete your comment, and if you persist, I will uh, mute you. For any event God wants, he knows how to bring it about. Premise yep. two, for any event God wants, he is capable of bringing it about. Actually, I think this is probably the best time to bring in the first problem with this argument, and that is that it assumes that there is a singular, there is a singular absolute will in God, and that God can't do things like actively will something and then permissively will it because when he says for any event god wants he knows how to bring it about but is this under active will like god wills everyone be saved but that doesn't mean that everybody is saved you know like we know from the um from the epistle of jude that there are people currently in hell from sodom right but we also know that christ wills everyone be saved i think this is actually i won't i won't i won't quote the specific like i've got one in mind, I think it's one of the epistles in, in one of the uh, one of the epistles to Timothy, but I don't know that. I'm only saying that because that's on my mind, right? God, God wills everything, everyone to be saved. Yeah, but He also permits people go to hell, in the same way that I uh, actively love my, like I could actively love my child, but I also allow myself to spank him for some other greater purpose, such as you know humility, or you know something like this, right? So, God can obviously actively desire a particular event, but in view of some greater good, he may permit some other one. So I'd actually, I think there's a strong argument here to actually just completely reject his first premise here. Although, that wasn't my initial observation. That, that observation was from uh, Buckley, actually. Uh, my other um, observation I'll get into in a second. Conclusion. Therefore, if God chooses to bring about a particular event, it must occur. It's pretty uncontroversial, really. I think most Christians would agree to this. To deny any step of this would be to deny any reasonable ideas of omnipotence or omniscience. They would therefore sacrifice one of the attributes, and then they don't believe in this idea of God anymore, so the argument doesn't apply to them. Well, I mean, I think I've shown why that doesn't... I don't have to necessarily accept that. So, either they're a Christian with beliefs that are a wide exception, damn heretics, or they just converted away from Christianity mid-conversation, which, alright, fine. Assuming they agree to this, uh, we just start plugging in things with respect to events. So, an event could be an agent interpreting God's communication. So, let's get into it. Premise one, for any message God wants to communicate, he knows how to communicate it such that it will be interpreted correctly. Premise two, for any message God wants to communicate, he is capable of communicating it such that it will be interpreted correctly. And here's the massive leap. Conclusion, therefore, if God chooses to communicate a message, it must be interpreted correctly. That doesn't follow. Because first of all, God is under no obligation to make the scriptures or divine tradition completely manifestly visible to any person. Right, uh, Franzelin actually talks about it in this book when he talks about the Protestants. He says that, or he says something like, at least I was thinking about it when I was reading it, because it's a very um, opaque book. If you were to have private interpretation of the scripture, that would mean that every single person were interpreting was interpreting the scripture through the Holy Spirit. Right, if you were to have valid private interpretation, which would require a multiplication of an extraordinary gift. Now, obviously, this isn't. This is manifestly false because common experience tells us that there are numerous contradictions between the Protestant denominations, like intractable ones, and there can't be contradictions in God. So that obviously isn't true. But also, like, we'd reject this as Catholics, right? So this can't be applied to, to Christianity generally. In addition, it also, it also assumes... The, the thing that struck me when I was thinking about this is that I think it's implied... And he actually, actually he goes on to say this in a minute. He talks about, well, reading the Bible, right? This this whole idea that he has implies that I can sit and read a Bible and I will necessarily get a, a manifestly true interpretation of it. You know, a completely true and sure by the Holy Spirit view. But that's not necessarily true. God could create something that does provide a valid interpretation of the scriptures, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it will be you. I believe it's fitting that God would produce these scriptures and have some sort of, some sort of authoritative authoritative interpreter. We would say that's the church and the magisterium. But it doesn't imply 
in order to fulfill that, that doesn't mean that the person has to get some interior illumination or some sort of thing like this when it comes to interpreting the scripture. And I think this is basically the solution to this problem. In fact, we'll, we'll continue along a little bit. We'll let him talk. Now, a bit what's an obvious example of God communicating a message? Reading the Bible is probably the best example because the Bible is meant to be communication from God. The method doesn't matter. The argument still applies, even when you put human... No, no it doesn't because... Actually, this is where the magisterium comes in, because it doesn't rule on everything. We can still read the scriptures and, by a level of interpretation, come to a, a level of understanding. We might be incorrect, though. It's not infallible knowledge. I can read, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the Gospels and come to the conclusion that Jesus is the Messiah without, you know, the, the magisterium telling me that, at least on the basis of what the documents themselves say. I can say that... The Gospel of John claims that Jesus is God. The Father and I are one. You know, I can I can build an interpretation of this. I can even... Could I come to a moral certitude? I'm not sure I could come to... Maybe I could come to a moral certitude, right? I think that you could definitively exclude certain ideas based on a natural interpretation of Scripture on moral certitude, which means there's still room for error because it's founded in natural reason. By moral certitude, I mean, like, my mind knows that it is true, you know, of course, there could be errors with reason and stuff like this. But in terms of certitude of faith, which is absolutely certain, as certain as, you know, the existence of God, that's something that we couldn't get by reading the scriptures, and that's what the church provides when it interprets. Uh, as we read in the scriptures, you know, the spirit is given to the church, and the spirit being God knows all, and therefore can interpret the scriptures correctly. Now, we, in the Roman Catholic Church, we have our magisterium, and it exists from the uh, the time of Christ. Christ established it. We'll get into the arguments as to why later on. But this has been the mechanism by which these authorita authoritative interpretations have been produced. We see an example of the action of the magisterium in Acts chapter 15 of the council. And we even see Christ himself backing the decisions of that council, at least in my view, in the book of Revelation, when he talks about people disobeying. At least I think it was... I think it was that. Yeah, this is me kind of going off-piste. <laughs> but this continues on throughout the history of the church. We have our ecumenical councils, we have infallible papal pronouncements, and we have this manifest even now. Now, a person might say, or this fellow might say, well, aren't you just kicking the problem down, like, you know, taking a can of kicking it down the street, you know? How do you ensure a valid interpretation of the magisterial documents, you know? How is it that you could pick up the Council of Trent and read it and, you know, come to a certain, certain conclusion about that? Well, the magisterium is alive. It can articulate things. And eventually it reaches a certain point where the ideas are being, uh, you know, discussed in a conversation. So we could come to knowledge through that conversation. We can, you know, the uh, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, you know, comes out with dubia, and these clarify issues in, in current teaching, right? And the Pope can, of course, uh, like, let me think of an example. The Doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, right? It turns out that when the Doctrine of the Immaculate conception was proclaimed, there was a dispute just beforehand as to whether or not it was fallible, I think it was apostolic, or ecclesiastical tradition, or whether or not it was um, infallible divine tradition. And the approbation of the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception was determined to be divine infallible tradition. And that's why we hold it as um, infallible now. So, you know, we have this ongoing conversation with the magisterium and to be honest there's okay there's a difference between actually believing it and knowing the conceptual content like anybody can know the, the conceptual content of the scriptures right they can come to conclusions not reliable on the certitude of faith conclusions but certain conclusions about reading the scriptures faith alone can give the certitude of faith but we can have certain things elucidated by the living magisterium which you know is, is carried out through means of people if you were to deny this, you'd be denying the capability for human beings to communicate truth. So we're kind of at a situation where we can say, you know, I can come to a moral certitude, I think, about what is in a certain document after discussion with the people who proclaim it, which would be the magisterium. Uh, but we can't come to the certitude of faith because that would be of God, right? So it would basically be 
it would be kind of like scientific knowledge. Like you can't have a scientific, you can't have certitude of faith in scientific knowledge, right? You can have a moral certitude, likewise. It's like anything in history, I think. I'm kind of kind of rambling on here. And in terms of proofs for uh, the papacy, I've written in the document, oh, two thirds of a page roughly, on that issue. So. You, you see this manifest in the behavior of Peter and the Church Fathers, right? So, we in the Catholic Church would hold that the Pope has supremacy over the Church, and is head of the Magisterium... Impl well, actually, maybe that's, that's the way of wording it. The Vicar of the Magisterium, the head of the Church, of course, is Christ. And he teaches from the Scriptures and from Divine Tradition. And we see this in that Jesus tells Peter in John 21, you know, Peter, feed my sheep. There is, of course, the famous verse, in, the famous verses in Matthew 16, where he says, "Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I shall build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail." This is also very similar to the proclamation of Eliakim as the prime minister of Judah in the Book of Isaiah. You also see this manifest in Peter's behaviour. Like, for example, in Second uh, Peter, that he says that no, that no matter of scripture is private interpretation. But you see him continually interpreting the scriptures and acting in his own authority in the book of Acts. So, for example, uh, when he's dealing with Cornelius, he takes it upon himself before the council of um, before the council of Jerusalem to baptize uh, the uh, the pagans. He he completely disregards any kind of moral quibbles. Although I can't remember exactly this. You see, I'm relying on arguments that I had before, right? Yeah, but he can act in his own his own authority. Uh, you see a, something like this in Acts 1, where he interprets one of the Psalms as Judas and then proclaims to the whole church that a new apostle needs to be elected. And, you know, many other places. One of them that strikes me... Actually, that's a, that's a very... That's a very uh, it's, a, it's a funny argument. I'm, I'm sort of looking strange because I've got the camera on, aren't I? Yeah, there's, there's many arguments in, in Acts. And then you see this born through in the... Um, in the apostolic fathers, right? Those 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 fathers that immediately came after Christ and also in well, immediately after the apostles, and in the church fathers as they go down the ages. So for example, Saint Ignatius of Antioch, who was writing in about one hundred and seven AD, which to my understanding is about five years after the death of John the Apostle, who was the last apostle, writes to the city of Rome saying that it presides over charity which, when interpreted in line of uh, Peter feed my sheep, you know, that's that indicates a certain level of power that Rome has. Additionally, slightly later on, about 80 years later, you have uh, Saint Irenaeus of Lyon, the Bishop of Lyon, somebody who was taught by the one of the disciples of the Apostle John, saying that churches are only churches insofar as they agree with the Church of Rome. So this is very, very soon after... Um, the death of the last apostle and you see many other people proclaiming other such things similar to this you know i've heard the people saying that saint athanasius has appealed to the decisions of rome you see it implicit in some of the acts of certain councils you see it in leo the great's tome which was in the middle of the fifth century you see it all over the place right so there's all kinds of history in fact i am unaware of really anybody denying petrine uh Petrine primacy beyond maybe small groups of heretics like Gnostics and stuff like this uh, before the 15th, before the 16th century. Like the the uh, Orthodox will acknowledge that Peter has primacy even now, even when they're out of communion with it. So you see, there's a wide amount of evidence, and I'm only giving you a kind of an ad hoc summation of these here uh, to suggest that there is an authentic magisterium established by Christ that can provide teaching to solve the exact problem that you are stating in an exact and manifest way. It, one of the things that struck me when I was reading the scriptures, and again, you know, moral certitude, this is only my interpretation, is that it seems rather strange that God uh, would establish the highest of mountains and then make that mountain not visible. So I don't think that having this interior illuminationism can really, um, really fly. Like, you can't just read the Bible like that. Any thoughts, chat? I don't see anybody really saying anything. I'm going to check to see. Nope, no one said anything, I don't think. I'll, I'll refresh that. So, um, I'm going to refresh that and then we'll continue. I just want to make sure, because I see more people are watching, but nobody's really uh, commenting. Okay, I guess they're just not like <laughs> commenting. Okay, fam. Uh, we will continue then.
Hickmans in the midst of the process, God would know how to communicate his message to them such that it would be recorded accurately. He is omniscient. So if God wants his message communicated through the Bible, it must occur. He is omnipotent. Well, unless there's distinctions, again, in active and permissive will, like God could permit certain people to misunderstand so that they would be crucified. You know, well, actually, well that slipped out, didn't it? <laughs> he, he permits certain people to misunderstand for good reasons. And if the Bible is communication from God, then someone reading and interpreting the Bible would be interpreting God's communications. So according to this argument, it's impossible to misinterpret the Bible. No. <laughs> so... How do we explain situations like this, especially over a word like is? Even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Now, I'm going to read it one more time, and now I'm going to pick up right where Tommy and Murphy start speaking. Listen to this. Even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Jesus wasn't saying he was in heaven. I'm not, I'm not kidding you. He pastes the verse in the very next statement. You know, for reference, Roman Catholics believe that Christ, even on earth, had the beatific vision. He says, Jesus wasn't saying he was in heaven at that time. In fact, he was saying he wasn't. Are you kidding me? I don't think that I've ever been so solidly entertained uh, by watching two pastors argue over a linking verb. I mean, these things are actually really, really important. Like, that, that's, that's the thing I don't think a lot of um, a lot of modern people don't understand. Like, these distinctions in doctrine. So, for example, right, classical theism versus, um, I don't know, theistic personalism. These things have huge, huge impacts on reality. If God is classically theistic that is he is pure being and you know providing being to all things right then that implies you know certain limits to freedom of the will for example it implies a lot of things if god is simply you know a, a superhero if god is simply this sort of floating being that does stuff that also limits his power you know you're going to come out with a completely different philosophy if you have like you know ever so slightly different views of god so like for example right um at nicaea right if you have the homo usios argument so god so god as in god the son is the same substance as the father right if you have that then that means that god is the omnipotent son of, of god you know so that means that he can redeem the human race and such and such but if you add the extra i which is homo usios uh you end up with a situation where christ can redeem because he's not omnipotent. He can't forgive sins in his, his in his nature. He's not God. Right? You, you break things if you change, like, s tiny little things. But I think that... I, I don't understand how secular people can't understand that. You know? Because you can have a slight error in a um, in a statistical method, and then you completely nullify, um, you know, 60 years of research in the, the psychological domain and stuff like this. You know? Um, I'm thinking of um, null hypothesis statistical testing for reference. Also, the summary of the disagreement through sarcastic monologue is pretty great. You remember that time when I said the Son of Man which is in heaven? I actually wasn't in heaven at all. Actually, you know what I meant? I was not in heaven. I was just telling you by saying that that I came down from heaven. But I wasn't there right then. Even though I used is, and that is present tense. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'd say that it's safe to say that these two individuals read the same communication from God and came to two very different conclusions. And no man... Yes. <laughs> ...man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. Now, also in that verse, you know what you have? Jesus saying that present tense he had already ascended up to heaven because he's God. That's what the verse says. Amen. But he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is, 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 present tense, is in heaven. Right now, right. while he's speaking and talking to someone. That, it, it makes me so angry because there are so many people that don't know their Bible that well. And this deceit, deceitful, stinking snake is just lying to people about what the Bible plainly says. Right. The Son of Man, which is in heaven. It's present tense. I, I don't think this is a very good representation of Christianity, to be honest. I think, I can understand why he's getting passionate, but, like, come on. Right. Bible talks about people handling the word of God deceitfully. That's thinking Tommy McMurtry and Stephen Anderson and all these liars. All right, all right. I mean, actually, to be fair, like if he had if he had reasons to substantiate why these people are liars, like I could understand why he would get so angry. I haven't seen any evidence of this because he hasn't placed this there. So, it's enough of that. Uh, now, contradictory expressions of the Bible should not exist according to our earlier argumentation, but they do. Therefore, God does not exist. At least, not in the way Christians generally describe him. He is either not omnipotent, not omniscient. Or neither, but he's not both. This would mean something more. Well, I mean, unless you have an authentic magisterium, which is exterior to human beings, if you have the Holy Spirit act through those human beings and provide infallible, um, you know, teaching, that that would be a way of solving it. In fact, that was actually the way that we have always done it. 
And in fact, that was the argument that we made against uh, against sects like uh, you know little independent churches, right? That's how we argued against the Gnostics. We argued on the basis of authority. So we've been doing this since like the second century in in manifest obvious detail. At least this particular argument, but it's been there since the beginning. So um, we we've already thought about this. More akin to a pagan view of God. Maybe he's just one among many. Maybe this is why we have many texts of this kind and many religions around the world. Hmm? Now, what about people who are just unable to understand the communication for whatever reason? For example, someone who might read it, but the understanding of the text just kind of flies over their head and they become a creationist or not a creationist or whatever it is. Well, that would mean that someone can escape communication from an omnipotent God because they're inept. <laughs> so how omnipotent is that if he can be defeated by ineptness? There's a way with we well, well, think about it this way, right? If you've got a situation where somebody misunderstands something, they can accept correction. And that provides them with a very great virtue, and that's humility. So that's at least one reason, right? Also, there's a serious, like, pr first principles problem with this assertion. Because if God wanted to reveal himself entirely, for example, right? I think this is probably the only real... Yeah. Say God wanted to reveal himself entirely. That would mean that a person in their mind would have to have every single attribute of God. Now, we as Christians all, like, you know, you know, like, this is the authentic teaching of, you know, just Christianity, right? We understand God to be pure being, right? So if I had a complete apprehension of God as pure being, which is also existence, you know, existence itself, that by which all things are granted being, right? That would mean that in my mind, I would have a pure existence, another pure existence. But God can't create himself twice, right? You can't make the distinction of saying, well, God is in your mind, that's the distinction, because existence is a universal it's not something that has position so god couldn't by his own by like just by by means of logical contradiction you know he couldn't you know fill your mind with everything about him because that would entail another him right that would be that would be one that'd be another reason how this fails you know there was another argument as well it's in the uh, notes if you want to read it i can't remember it be glad of this actually i feel like i should probably read it it's just something I typed up, so just to be on the safe side, fellas. Let's use humility. That's another one. If man were perfect, he wouldn't need society, right? But societies bring about greater good. So if I were entirely perfect, if I had no need of any other human person, then what reason would I need for um, another person to reproduce with? Right? Like, I could just cut my finger off and produce another Elliot. I, I wouldn't need my fiancé. But I can tell you that because of my imperfection in this respect, that I have a fiancé and I deeply love her and my life is richer because of it. Because of my own imperfection and my inability to reproduce myself, I, I am happier. And I have produced a greater unit than I had before. So, you know, being a cog in the machine that can't do everything... That often just contributes to a greater machine. Some people will take, so let's talk about it. So it might be that God desires to communicate different messages to different people, even if he's using the same text. It could be that God just wants these people to disagree. Calvinists will sometimes double down on this, that there are a bunch of reprobates, people that are just designed to go to hell. Even this pastor seems to be of a similar position, though distinct, it's not quite the same thing. He's calling Tommy McMurtry a liar, an active deceiver. He's not saying that he just doesn't get it. He's saying that he's read and interpreted the text correctly, because how could you not, and then choosing to lie about it. But the reprobate objection will only fly with people that are already this kind of Christian. This wouldn't work for anyone who thinks that free will is part of the game, for example. Or that people can genuinely read and not understand the true message of the Bible, but then come to an understanding of it later. Or anyone who thinks that a genuine conversion can take place, or believes that someone can come to a greater understanding of their relationship with God, especially through reading the same Bible they've been reading already. Anybody who holds any of those positions, the interpretation argument works. Or most... Faith, faith may come through hearing, but it isn't the mere fact of having the book in front of you that gives you the faith. Damn it. Anyone who believes that two Christians from different churches in different denominations can both be genuine Christians by the grace of God. I am going to go ahead and skip to this because there's another argument that he makes entailed on that that I don't, I don't think is worth really listening to. First of all, because it's not really applicable, but also because uh, I just think it's very not very nice. Argument is that the Christian kind of has to accept these entailments or they have to sacrifice key elements of the faith in order to no, explain how Christianity has manifested over the... In fact, actually, this points to Catholicism over um, over Protestantism. This doesn't do anything. This, in fact, actually strengthens us because you've just rebuked um, a group of heretics who think that they can just come to private judgment. ...course of history. And some will just override it with the power of faith or whatever, possibly because they're more afraid of hell than being called illogical. Which, you know, hell is scary. 
a lot of ex-Christians can empathize with that. But the key thing here is that a lot of Christians will get frustrated with this, they can't find a way out, and then they just, they aren't as likely to come at you much after this. Uh, they won't be as interested in the conversation. And I've learned <laughs> that once someone trying to witness to you has realized that the conversation is a certain level of challenging, they just kind of stop. And often that's the end goal, but they'll probably have a go at me in the comment section of this video. <laughs> Christians, uh, if you have a way out of this, let me know what you think it is. I'm interested in what you have there to you say. There you go. I've seen this argument run by people for some time against some very smart Christians. And I... by, by the way, guys, um, if you want to, um, you want to ask questions because we're coming towards the end of the video, uh, please do. I was going to actually, um, you know, have a go at some pagan, uh, some pagan views uh, towards the end. But, uh, you know, prepare questions if you want I've to. I've never seen them get out of it. But that doesn't mean there isn't an answer here. The best thing about this argument to me is that it's an atheistic argument, but polytheists can easily use it. It doesn't apply. Well, like, there you go, right? Okay, so you've got your argument. Like, you know, this video, it's been kind of, you know, it's it's kind of a uh, hit and miss because this was just something I typed up in about 45 minutes. I didn't bother memorizing it or anything. Um, go ahead and read this and uh, take it on then, uh, Keltoid, Ocean Keltoid. Like, I mean, you've got your argument from another Christian, right? Please show me why I'm wrong apply to us at all. Our gods are not generally seen as omnipotent or omniscient, so the fallout of those descriptors don't come back on us. There is zero... I mean, the, the, the problem with this is that this is what struck me while I was listening to him. I don't know if he actually believes this, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you have a universe which is purely just gods, right? You have many different gods which are unified by a certain existence. So, you, as you've said, they're not omnipotent and they're not omniscient. But they are united by existence. They exist in the same reality... Insofar as they exist, they receive from a pre-existent existence. Because how could something come to exist without a previously existent existence? There, there needs to be some sort of existence linking them. Even if you would say they were co-eternal, they'd have to be linked by some sort of existence. Because if they weren't, then you'd have to come up with a way in which these, these pagan deities exist which is distinct from one another. Like, not in terms of their essence, just existence simply. But you can't do that because existence is, um, is you know, it's either you are or you aren't. There's no way to, you know, chip away at the existence, like pure existence in itself, uh, in order to make the distinctions that you want. You have... you, you Sorry, someone is uh, talking to me through the window. Uh, you have this situation where you have to speak about a pure existence. There's no way of getting around it. And also, because these deities are personal, um, and you are personal, and being personal is indivisible because the intellect and will, uh, you know, your soul is um, indivisible because thoughts and your choices are indivisible, it follows that the, that the existence has intellect and will. And also personhood, because personhood is also indivisible. indivisible. It's like, I am not half Elliot. I can't be half Elliot. This is impossible. I'm either Elliot or I'm not Elliot. Now, thank you. Thank God, I am Elliot. But likewise, God has to possess personhood in some manner, and it can't be divided up. This isn't something that can be composite and you know constructed. You can't you can't make that kind of argument. So that would mean that the existence which provides existence to your gods, uh, which is which is actually prior to them, is also personal. Which would mean that the God of the Bible, because this is the God of the Bible without revelation. This means that the God of the Bible is prior to your, your God. So why would you, first of all, why would you worship uh, these these subordinate deities when you've got a much greater deity which provides all existence to your deities? Uh, right there. That's the first one. Second of all, I understand that there's some understand, like there was some something to do with Pelagianism influencing that. And from what I understand, this is the idea that man is inherently perfectible without God. Now, the problem with this is, is that if you have pure existence, I am that I am, as the scriptures call it in Exodus 3, if you have a situation where all being is flowing from personal, uh, a personal absolute existence, right? how is it that you can be perfected without either the permissive or active will of the thing providing being? You can't. So, Pelagianism, Pelagianism insofar as that is concerned, is, fa is a failure. Right, at least as I have stated it, because I have a feeling that Pelagius himself would have known a lot about classical theism and probably wasn't have fallen into this mistake. Maybe he did though. I don't know. Uh, that's basically what I had to say um, about this fella here. It would be nice if he could uh, get back to me. Uh, you can watch the stream if you want, but I have the document and it'll probably be a lot quicker to read the document. It's about four pages. Right, so if you want to read that, 
and uh, take it on, please, please do. Uh, so we're going to read the comments right now. Dune goes, good point. Uh, are there any questions, guys? Come on, fellas. I'll tell you what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pop to the loo. I will uh, give you guys, like, five minutes to, uh, you know, come up with questions. I actually did think of a um, an argument that could be made against my uh, premise about existence, right? And that is, um, I understand that there are some philosophers who hold that um, that existence is some sort of second order property. Now, I'm not precisely sure what that means, but I've seen it articulated by a particular atheist uh, in this manner. I, at least this is what came up in the conversation when I was discussing it. And that is that existence by some modern philosophers is considered to be an abstract, an abstract thing, right? So you you have concrete things which have existence, but existence itself is more abstract than the uh, <laughs> than the existence that we've um, you know the existence that's being received. But I don't think this makes any sense for the simple reason of how can something that grants existence be less existent than the thing it's providing existence to? I don't think it makes any sense. Okay, so, um, question here. Socks on my feet. Socks on my feet. Okay. I have heard this argument before from New Atheists. Did he mention omnipresence? I... No, he didn't. He mentioned omniscience and, um, and omnipotence. MG said, What type of pagans have you have you been talking to? Because many pagans have different views or ideas of the world consciousness gods. Well, I, I've looked mostly into, this, like, various Reddit kinds. Uh, I talked to Wiccans a bit. They don't appear to have any kind of organized metaphysics, but I will say, I've only been digging into it. I've only dug into it probably a few hours in aggregate. I can't really find any real coherent first principles linking them. So, um, but I could be jumping the gun on that one. Uh, that's that's one group. The other group were, um, you know, the pagans board. I was mostly trying to ascertain their um, their intrinsic their extrinsic motivation. Because I think I could go back and forth with philosophical arguments all day, but if people don't believe in paganism for the philosophical reasons, then what's the point? So I figured I'd try and find out why they believe it beyond that. Because, you know, we could... Like, some people did say, oh, it's because it's philosophically coherent. And those people, yeah, fine, that's, that's great, right? But I don't think the majority of people are like that, and I don't think the majority of believers generally are like that. So, um... I decided I go and find out the other reasons. So, um, if that's everyone's questions, uh, I'll give you like twenty seconds to give any final questions. I'll uh, I'll close up the stream. Please, please, uh, tweet at this guy, and uh, let him know I've made this. Also, you know, go into his video and uh, comment, letting him know I made this, because you know what's the point of me sitting here and giving a forty-five minute uh, presentation half memorized if I don't get some sort of response from anyone. Um. I think that's probably everything. Okay, I'm going to go uh, switch off the stream then. Uh, thanks a lot, guys. Um, I hope you enjoyed the stream. Uh, see you guys later. Bye-bye.